So 2024 is the 75th anniversary of How Great Thou Art. I've got to ask you, you are one of the many artists involved in this new rendition of the song. Why do you think the song has resonated historically so much with people? Yeah, it's a fascinating one because it, it definitely, you know, you go around churches, different streams and expressions of church. You'd be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't find some kind of connection to this hymn. And I know as soon as it hit the shores of America all those years ago, with Billy Graham crusades and stuff, it, it just went well, like wildfire. And um, I think it might be because it's it has this beautiful story. It starts with creation, gets to the cross, but but we get our chance to to say what we think about those things. I think some of the best hymns, they're like a, a classroom and a chapel. They tell us something <laughs> inspiring, you know, educate us, inspire us, bring something to mind, and then they give us chance to respond to that, say what we think about that. And this this uh, hymn does that in the verses. It's like that classroom. And in the choruses, they're like this chapel where we get to express our devotion. Yeah, I love that. You know, you get to sort of learn and then ponder and, and worship, you know, after yeah. that. And it's sort of all one experience. Wh where did this idea come from with the 75th anniversary to say, hey, let's get all these powerhouse artists together to do a new version of this beloved hymn? Yeah, so normally um, some of these old hymns, you can do whatever you want with them. They're public domain. You can add a chorus. You can leave a verse out, chop and change bits up. But with this hymn, it's still under copyright, and the publisher is called Stuart Hine Trust. And they're very protective of it. Like normally if you go and say, hey, I want to do this to it or change this up, they, they wouldn't permit that. Um, and they actually, this uh, trust where you know they've been putting – loads of proceeds for years into into beautiful causes and so they actually came to me and said um it's the 75th anniversary of the hymn um coming up but also what a lot of people don't know is all the words that we sing in this hymn this english version were written in ukraine by a british missionary stuart hine where the trust came from and so these these words were written in the carpathian mountains of ukraine and so it, it seems like an especially um, poignant time to have a, a version, a new version. So they said, look, the old version is what it is, and it will always be what it is, but could you write a new section and have a brand new uh, version of this? Uh, and so, yeah, got together with a friend of mine called Mitch Wong, and we tried to rise to the challenge. Very, um, a lot of trepidation, you know, messing with something that people love so much already is not something you take lightly. But we jumped yeah. into it and we felt like from the beginning, I think that we should have the word war in this hymn. And that feels like a strange uh, word in a worship song or something for a Sunday morning. But actually, that's the reality of life, right? And worship isn't meant to be escapist. So we're meant to face the brutal reality sometimes of our world head on, but then sing with grace and faith and hope over that. And so hopefully that's what the new version does. It's the new words, you know. And as we walk this broken, warring world, um, we're going to pray, deliver us from evil, your kingdom come, and we're going to sing how great you are with hope in our hearts. And and um, it was beautiful uh, getting to write it, but then, like you say, when it really came to life, it was in the studio with all his other powerhouse vocals on it, Hilary Scott from Lady A, and Naomi Rain, Taya, Chris Tomlin, Blessing Offer. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. It was wonderful seeing it come to life. Yeah, and that that history in light of what's going on, you know, here we are at the two year anniversary of the Ukraine war, and and regardless of where people stand on any of those issues, the the reality of people, you know, suffering and what is happening there, and then that history of the song, I did not know that history. Were were you familiar with that coming into this project? Yeah, I was a little familiar with it, but obviously I've done a bit of a deeper dive since then, and what's really special is um, so. Everyone's waived all kind of rights or royalties to this. So all of the proceeds, wherever this is led or streamed or bought or whatever, all the proceeds will go to Ukraine and to humanitarian causes in Eastern Europe, and which is really, really um, special part of it. And and uh, another beautiful part of the story was uh, we recorded this in two studios, but one of them was RCA Studio B in Nashville, and that's where Elvis recorded his classic version of this hymn so that was a cool moment too and actually in the video on youtube 
you'll see him appear at one point. There's a he's hanging on the wall in there, and and Matt Maher is playing the piano that was recorded on that version. So that was a really lovely thing too. Yeah, no, that that's really a, a fascinating history there and a good cause. You know, I think it's so easy with the news cycle, you move on to the next thing and people don't always remember that there are people hurting and in desperate need. And so you guys are helping them there in Ukraine through this song. But you mentioned something before about, well, a couple of things that I think are important. You know, obviously the idea of of war or battle, you know, we don't always think about that in worship songs. And yet, you know, you look at Ephesians six, there's a spiritual battle going going on. You look yeah. at just life in general, we all face battles. So I think that's really pertinent. Um, yeah. but, but one of the other things you said about escapism and, you know, worship music, how in your view, as somebody who's been doing this for a long time, can worship music better position us to sort of take on real life issues, be the hands and feet of Jesus? Yeah, I think songs, have such a beautiful opportunity to do that. You know, they they can go so deep into people's lives and become the soundtrack to their most intense moments, be that joy or be it pain and suffering. And honestly, we have a we have a, a blueprint for that in the Psalms. You know, right there in the middle of the Bible, these 150 songs would have been the hymn book of Jesus as he walked this earth. But these it's astonishing really, isn't it? There's a, there's a song book in the middle of the Bible. And these songs are teeming with emotion i mean they are so intense every imaginable emotions in there you know anger and desperation and you know um and then you've got joy and celebration and and pretty much everything in between and anxiety fear you know all all the things that we face now and it is it is astonishing that these songs that were written 3000 years ago were pretty much nothing in our life looks the same as what their life looked like. These songs still live and live in us and resonate with us. And so that's, that's the kind of uh, example for us. And for me, uh, I, I kind of learned this uh, to a degree years ago, um, we wrote, uh, my wife and I wrote this song, Blessed Be Your Name. And the reason was we were in America at the time on sabbatical and 9-11 had just happened. And we were traveling around churches, and I felt like a lot of the preachers were speaking some really helpful things. But I was thinking, where are the songs? It feels like we're just singing all the songs we always sung, but this just had this major national you know, event that everyone's feeling has a lot of questions, and there's a sense of brokenness. And you know, where are the songs? Where's the vocabulary for a moment like this? And it feels... Like we should have one because that would be relevant and helpful to people, but also because it's hugely biblical. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's incredibly important to be thinking through. And you know, somebody like like you, you know, a lot of people they create music and it's out there and it's popular, and you know, and then it sort of goes to the wayside, and people still listen to it. But when it comes to worship, that holds the potential to be, as you were just saying, something that stays with people for a very, very long time. And yeah. it's used in actual worship of God. So I would imagine there's a a weightiness to that that doesn't necessarily maybe exist as much in regular mainstream Christian music. What what lessons have you learned? What are some of the biggest lessons you've learned? You've been doing this a long time now and have had a chance to work on a lot of incredible projects. Yeah, on, honestly, uh, lots of lessons. I mean, one of them would be like to put your own story in there but not to such a detail that other people can't attach their own story to it right so you you've got to be real and uh but you know and so it's you're not faking it right but at the same time if you're so specific to your to your own everyday thing other people can't attach their own stories to it so that's one thing uh universal theme in a unique way is a great thing for any songwriter and you know, sing about something that matters to people, that is relevant, that touches us all. That's biblical in, in, in it, if you're a worship songwriter. You know, the universal theme, but try and find a unique way to say it. Try and find a, a fresh way in, you know, whether it be melodically or lyrically. And honestly, the biggest thing I learned along the way is is co-write. We're, we're better together. Most things in the kingdom of God are designed to be not be done as the Lone Ranger. You know, you when we when we get together and bring the best out of each other and lean into each other's um, strengths, it can be very special. And that definitely was the case with How Great Thou Art. From the co-write with um, Mitch Wong through to Matt Meyer and a guy called Steve Marcia producing it through to those 15 friends joining in the studio 
the and, and and actually to be honest all the managements and the labels all agreeing to it all jumping into it wholeheartedly saying we can take it to radio all those little things it's been a gigantic team effort and that that's probably the biggest lesson for me of always um we're designed to flow in community well, I love that. And my final question for you, where can people go to get your version of How Great Thou Art? You can go all the normal kind of digital streaming platforms, Spotify and Amazon and Apple and all those, and you can get it on YouTube. We have a lovely video featuring all those singers on there. Um, and uh, if you want to see a live version of it, I just led it at If Gathering in Dallas this week uh, where we had different nations from around the world join us so so i sung some sections but we had sections sung from singapore india romania um a couple other places and so if you if you look up on youtube if gathering um from a few days ago uh you can see a beautiful live version of it with about ten thousand people in a room singing it well, very good. I really appreciate you taking the time, joining us and sharing. Again, it's How Great Thou Art. We all know the song. You've put a new version out and people can support Ukraine in the process of supporting that. that song. Thanks for your time today. Oh, it's a pleasure to speak to you. Thanks so much.